common knowledge that AIDS has hit the arts community particularly hard. So many of the well-known people who've died of AIDS have been artists or performers. But that's not really what this story is about. I wanted to find out what the fact of AIDS is doing to art itself, because artists are working in a new environment these days. People are calling the AIDS era the 20th century plague, or our Vietnam. And artists can't help but respond to and reflect the world around them. Sometimes the result is political agitprop. It's angry and direct and obvious. But art about AIDS can take much subtler forms. Often AIDS isn't even in the text. It's in the subtext or the context or in all three. For example, Jenny Holzer's new installation at the Dia Art Foundation in New York. Jenny Holzer's Laments is an exhibit you experience in the privacy of darkness. The subject is death executed in a seductive combination of lurid high-tech LED display signs, the artist's trademark, and the cool permanence of polished marble. There are 13 texts representing 13 deaths. They flash past on columns of colored light and stare up at us from the lids of stone sarcophagi. Holzer, who will represent the United States at the prestigious Venice Biennale in 1990, is just one of a generation of artists confronting thoughts and feelings usually associated with old age or with war. It's really not since Vietnam that you've been as likely to know someone that's going to die or, or think about dying yourself. It's, um, it's really been since then. It's a very sobering thing to confront death. Curator Gary Garrels is one of the founders of Visual AIDS, an ad hoc organization that coordinates AIDS-related art exhibits. The kind of joie de vivre that one associates with unfettered creativity seems in very short supply right now. Uh, I think what we're getting is a much more reflective, introspective, serious kind of art being made. Photographer Bill T. Jones, who lost his partner and lover, Arnie Zane, to AIDS in 1988, is perpetuating Zane's name and memory in the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company's new work. This piece is called Absence, dedicated to Zane and dance to Berlioz's Le Nuit d'Ete, extravagantly sad, heavily perfumed music from the early 19th century, when death was a popular and glamorous subject for artists. I want it to be the most elegant depiction of sadness and grief, one that enlivens the imagination and the heart, encourages us to open up and be more human. That's what I'd like an AIDS piece to be. It's very important to understand that, yes, Bill is mourning, but uh, Bill's mourning and sadness, just like all of his experiences, have informed a body of work. And ultimately, that is what the gift I have to give and what I hope will make logic make sense out of what seems to be senseless. What seems to be senseless is often shapeless and faceless, too. Newark-based choreographer Alfred Gallman confronts the abstract, intangible qualities of death, disease, grief, fear, and prejudice in his piece, civilized evil. He was inspired by the administrators, company members, designers, and audience members he's lost in the past few years. Losing teachers, losing choreographers, losing geniuses. It's cut off my growth, my personal experience, and it's cut off my value or my expectation for the future for myself because I missed something that I was supposed to get. It's like vitamins. I didn't get my vitamins. I didn't get my lesson. I didn't finish the course because my teacher passed on. When Charles Ludlam, the founder of the Ridiculous Theatrical Company, passed on in 1987, he left a thriving theater and a partner, Everett Quinton. Ludlum's genius was in creating campy send-ups of old literary genres. 
The mystery of Irma Vep is one of his best known. Everett Quinton is continuing that tradition solo in A Tale of Two Cities, a one-man version of the Dickens novel with all roles performed by a drag queen. It is first and foremost a comedy. My dear Mr. Cock, I fear you are not well. Yet one cannot help but notice the personal parallels between text and performer. This is, after all, the novel that begins, it was the best of times and the worst of times. But Quentin has purposely avoided translating his own tragedy into theater, as many gay playwrights have done. Everyone feels this incredible powerlessness, and they want to express themselves and express their powerlessness. And I think that's what it is. But what good is it if people are moved in the theater and they go out in the street and don't do anything? It's not enough. It's not enough to sit in the theater and be moved and cry because somebody died of AIDS. It is just not enough. The Bastille! It was theater, particularly gay theater, that first attacked the subject of AIDS because of the large homosexual population working in theater and because it became increasingly difficult to ignore. Alarm bells ringing, drums beating, the living sea raging and thundering against its new beach. The battle had begun. But recently, AIDS has become a frequent subplot or subtext in mainstream theater. The Heidi Chronicles, which won playwright Wendy Wasserstein a Pulitzer Prize, is essentially about the coming of age and subsequent disillusionment of a feminist art historian. A secondary plot follows Heidi's gay friend Peter, a pediatrician, whose gay liberation closely parallels the women's movement. My friend Stanley isn't very well. That was my phone call when you so adventurously arrived. That's what all this is coming from. You see, my world gets narrower and narrower. A person only has so many close friends. And in our lives, our friends are our families. I think that what we're seeing now is almost a second generation of AIDS plays, a second generation where AIDS is just a fact of life, which is basically what it is to a lot of people. Now that if you have a gay friend, if you know anybody who's gay, this is something that maybe, maybe he's not sick, but you're always worrying about him. But the persistent perception of AIDS as a gay disease and of the arts as a sort of gay ghetto takes this epidemic beyond the realm of medicine and into the more troublesome areas of personal ethics and prejudices. AIDS is bad PR. So some particularly image-conscious arts organizations are quick to point out that AIDS strikes people of all persuasions across the board. Yes, it is across the board. I say that statement is sometimes homophobic. When the art world throws up its hands and says, or the dance world in particular, we don't have that problem, it's like they say, we don't have the problem of homosexuality. We're not a bunch of queers, really. You know, we're not. And I'm insulted by that. The problem is, it's not the disease. It's people want to know how you got the disease. That is the craziness about this thing. Now, if you got cancer and you died, everyone is remorseful and it's a terrible thing. If you get AIDS and die, you go and die and quiet peace without letting us know. We don't want to see it, we don't want to hear it. In other words, AIDS carries a stigma that other diseases do not. It's assumed that an AIDS victim was a drug addict or a promiscuous homosexual. Moral judgments follow. I have this sneaking suspicion there are people who are sitting there feeling quite gleeful, actually, that we knew these are the inferior, uh, this is the inferior crop. And it's amazing how nature takes care and purges itself. True, we're losing some geniuses. I think AIDS is having a tremendous effect on the creativity in America today. I think that not only have we lost the conspicuous talents, you know, such as Michael Bennett, who's, who's lost to the American musical, is, is so large that there's, there's a hole there you could fall into on Broadway. Uh, but, but the number of people who are less famous, who are just starting their careers or in their middle of their careers. People who are spending their evenings taking care of someone who's sick, or, uh, you know, going to a meeting or doing things that, that's diverting a lot of energy from the, from the creative life of our culture. It's uh, as if you're looking at the stars at night and you see one by one they're going out. There will be, of course, as many artistic responses to AIDS as there are individual artists. 
It's really too soon to tell if a new plague art has been invented. We don't even know if we're at the beginning or the middle of this epidemic. We're certainly not at the end.